Um, welcome to this presentation. I'm principally going to cover the areas we did not finish covering in class. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about mainly the terms and conditions of sale of a contract of sale of goods. So in this presentation, we are going to look at really definitions on terms and conditions, what are the implied warranties, what are the implied terms, and what are the duties of the parties. There are just 15 slides, so I hope you enjoyed what I'm discussing and you're able to understand what I'm explaining to you. Now, when you talk about terms of a contract, we're talking about those things that you agreed to in the contract. What is it that you have put down in writing? Or what is it that you have agreed verbally in writing? So when we talk about terms, we have both express and implied terms. And the express terms are the terms that are said expressly, either in writing or verbally by word of mouth when you're contracting. If Jane is selling her car to Mary, Jane will tell Mary, I want, I, I want, I'm going to sell you my car at 4 million shillings. And Mary will say, yes, give it, I want a blue car that is with this kind of light. Those are the terms of agreement. Okay. So the express terms are what they agree to that should be a blue car deliver it at moves at this time, those are the express terms. The implied terms, on the other hand, are what the law implies to exist between the two of you, even if you don't talk about it, even if you don't express yourself. So when we talk about implied terms, this part, we are saying those are the terms that are existing in a contract because of the existence of the law or custom or court, and the law will consider them to exist even if you don't Say them expressly in the contract. So these implied terms are a sort of strict terms. In other words, you cannot change them, you cannot vary them or negate them. Because the law section 67 says that there will be deemed to exist and you cannot waive them. You know, where any right arises or in a supply of sale of goods, it shall not be negated. You cannot change your mind about you cannot cancel these implied terms. So these implied terms are those that are implied by law and the express terms are those that are said expressly. Now both the express and implied terms are called conditions in law. And a condition is a major term of a contract. In other words, if you fail to fulfill these express and implied terms, it permits the other party to cancel the contract, to repudiate the contract. Now I want to talk about The implied terms and conditions, the different implied terms and conditions. And the first one we are going to discuss is a condition as to title. Okay. So here condition as to title, we are saying that you must have the legal right of ownership, legal right of ownership, this part. You must have the legal right to sell what you're selling. You cannot wake up and sell something that is stolen. You must have the legal right to sell it. So the law requires that you must have title. That's why you find in this case of Roland versus Divo, you find that the claimant, a cab dealer, bought a cab from the defendant at that, that price. He painted the car, basically picked up the car, put it in his showroom and sold it at a higher price. Two months down the road, the car was caught by police and the person who bought it was told to hand back the car to the original owner. So it turned out the person who bought the car was a thief. I mean, did not have legal rights. They bought it from a thief. So that means they did not have title to the product. So the law requires that whatever you're selling, you must have legal ownership. And that is, even if you don't state that expressly in the contract, it will be implied in law. That whoever sells something must have legal ownership. They must have title to the goods that they're selling. The other condition is with request contract of sale by description. Here we are saying that if someone describes what they want from you, you're required by law to supply them what they have described. For example, if I tell Mary that I want a Mercedes S-Class round eyes, it means that she's required by law to supply me exactly that kind of car. She cannot wake up and sell something different. That is why Lord Blackburn here says that if you contract to sell peas, if you contract to sell peas, you cannot force a party to take beans because 
I have described to you that I want peas, so you cannot give me beans. If the description of the article provided is different in any way, it is not the article asked for. The other party is not bound to take it. So you find that in this case, Levi Kali and others versus Salim Muhammad, the plaintiff is contracted to sell to the defendant 200 tons of cement, which they described as two lands brand. Now the description here was two lands brand of cement. Just like you say you want Hima cement. The cement that was delivered by the plaintiff was instead Salona Tower cement, meaning they provided instant, for example, Toro cement. So the law says that the defendants were entitled to reject the cement on the grounds that what was supplies were not in accordance with the contract description. So the implied, um, the implied terms as to description required, if I describe something to you, you must supply me what I have described. Even if you don't write that in writing, if you fail to describe what I, if you fail to supply what I described, then the law says that I'm entitled to reject the contract, to repudiate the contract. Now, in a cell by sample, the law says that if I give you a sample of what I want, you must supply me exactly that sample. For example, there's a Bible here, my children's Bible. If I tell you that I want 50 Bibles like this, the law says that you're supposed to supply me 50 exact Bibles like this sample. In other words, you're not supposed to deviate because you're supposed to sell me exactly what is in this sample. The pages, the number of pages, the colors, everything must correspond to the sample. So if it is a contract of sale by sample, the law says that the quality of the bulk must correspond to the sample. In other words, what, what you supply me, the 50, must be exactly like the sample. Then I must be given a reasonable opportunity to inspect and compare my sample to what you've given me. And then the goods must be free from any defect that would render them useless by looking at them with a naked eye. In other words, if I examine this Bible on face value, it should be free from any defects. If there are defects that I haven't seen that are inherent, maybe in the type of pages, that's a different matter. But the law requires that what you should supply to me should correspond with the sample. Now, in this case, Drummond, Sons, and Van Ingen, the judge says that the function of the sample is to present to the naked eye the real meaning of the intention of the parties concerning the subject matter. Because it is very hard sometimes with imperfections of language, it's difficult or impossible to speak exactly what someone wants. So when they present the sample, they have given you their exact impression of what they want. The other condition is with respect to sell by sample and description. If I wake up and give you a description of what I want and a sample, for example, I say that I want 50 Bibles like this that are in red. I've given you the sample here and I've described it further by saying color red. That is a sell by description and sample. The law requires that what you should provide for me should correspond to the exact sample and additional description I've given. Let's read this case of Nicole versus Gods. The plaintiff agreed to sell some oil which they defined as foreign rape refined oil. And then they said it should be warranted only equal to sample. In other words, it should be exactly as is the sample. So they gave them a sample. But the oil that was supplied, even though it corresponded with the sample, it had been mixed with hemp oil. So it was adulterated, it was not clear oil. Court said that since the oil supplied was not in accordance with the description, the buyer was entitled to reject the same. Even if it was in accordance with one of aspects, the sample, but not the description, they were entitled to reject it. So this is another implied condition that whatever it is you're supplying, if it's this, the sale of goods is by sample and description, even if you don't put it down in writing, you're required in law to supply exactly as is the sample and the description. Now, the original law used to insist on quality and fitness for purpose before the new sale of goods act. It used to require that goods must correspond, must be of good quality and they must be fit for purpose. But that law has been changed with a new law. The new law no longer, under section 15, it no longer requires parties to insist that the products supplied are of mercantile quality or that they are fit for purpose. Right now, the law focuses on what we call caveat emptor. In other words, the buyer should be where? 
if you wake up and they sell to you something and it's a fake product, it is your problem. You as the buyer, you're supposed to be cautious and awake and aware of what you're buying. If you go to a window, for example, and you see a pair of shoes and you want it, the law says that it is your duty to look at those shoes, inspect them, try them on, do they fit, are they nice, are they, shake them up. Basically, that burden of inspecting quality is given to the buyer. It's no longer the responsibility of the seller. So there's no need for the seller anymore to be, if the buyer especially doesn't ask, the seller doesn't have to disclose any problems with the items they're selling or any defects in the goods. The law requires that the seller must be where, what we call caveat emptor. Now, what we've been looking at are implied conditions. And by conditions, we're saying implied terms, major terms of a contract. Now, I want us to look at implied warranties. The difference between a condition and a warranty is that a condition is a major term of a contract and a warranty is a minor term of a contract. Let's take an example. For example, if you're living moves and you're going to wind again, the condition will be the journey. You're going straight. You're not diverting. You're, you know, you're focused on getting to one again. That's a condition. The warranty, on the other hand, are the side distractions. Maybe you'll find that there are, side, there are people on the street begging money. There is a borderman who shouts at you. Those are just warranties. They are minor things. They don't affect your major journey of getting to one again. So we find that the law says that if there is a breach of a major condition, what we've covered so far, the first thing slides we looked at, it warrants, it gives you the right to reject the contract, to cancel the contract. But now, when you talk about warranties, if there is a breach of a warranty, it only allows the other person to, the person who is unhappy to claim damages, but they cannot forego the contract. So let's look at the different types of warranties. The first one is a warranty of quiet possession. And by quiet possession, we are saying it is, the law requires that when I buy something from you, I'm supposed to enjoy it quietly without interference from anyone you know if for example I'm, 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 uh, if for example i've bought land i should be able to enjoy that land without police coming to inquire is it yours who is this you know i should be able to enjoy it quietly and the, the other condition the other warranty is the warrant of, of freedom from encumbrances they're pretty much similar but this one encumbrances is saying if i buy the land there should be no other owner to that land, okay? If I buy a car from a garage, from a car, it should not have parking tickets, you know, repair expenses, all those other costs on it that I did not see or I was not told about. So both of these warranties allow someone who's unhappy to sue for damages. For example, if the car has repair expenses or parking tickets, I can pay them, then I claim my compensation from you. But it doesn't mean that I cancel the contract of the car. Because these warranties are minor, they are minor, they are not a major term of the contract. So the law will imply these two warranties to exist in the contract, even if we didn't sign on it. Because they are implied by law, they are part of the implied conditions and warranties in a sale of goods contract. Now, let's talk about some of the things that prevent us from enjoying these rights we've been talking about. The right to, you know, call it that the goods should be according to sample, according to description, that the seller must have the right title. The things that prevent people from, from enjoying these rights or enforcing these rights is what they call caveat emptor. The buyer should be aware. Like I've said, it is a duty of the buyer to inspect and look out for what you have. If you don't look out for what you're buying and you get fleeced, it is your loss. So the other thing is that sometimes we're buying things from sellers who don't know what they're selling. If you want to buy a Nokia phone from a window, for example, the seller has no idea about that phone. So he cannot tell you his proper judgment, competent judgment on the issue. So even if you sue, he also didn't know. He cannot be required to know in law because he's not an expert on the matter. Then sometimes it is impossible for us to examine the goods. Maybe the way they are packaged or the way they are delivered. So because you didn't examine the goods, they brought you some plates and most of them inside were broken and you can't inspect them. The other day I bought something from Jumia, a rack a plate a rack for plates and got home and i didn't open it until two weeks later because i didn't really need it initially and then by the time i recut it it has it was already broken so i was not able to examine the rack maybe negligently or whatever reason but what happened it was damaged and of course jimmy has an opportunity to return but i think he returned within seven days now my time had lapsed but what am i saying i could not enforce my right because 
it was not practical to do it anymore. I could not inspect it. I didn't inspect it. The other reason that we don't enjoy rights is because of the doctrine of privity of contract. Privity of contract means that you are not party to the contract. You know, the contract did not involve you at all. So because you're not party to the contract, you can't enforce it. You will find that if, for example, I buy a car from Mary and that car has a problem, my brother cannot come and force Mary to give me a, a good car in law because my brother was not party to that contract. So privity of contract means that the person who's involved in the contract is the only one who can sue. So because, for example, you buy a broken phone, you cannot sue the manufacturer who provided the phone to the window guy because you are not party to the contract between the manufacturer and the supplier, the person they supply it to. So that prevents you from enjoying these rights concerning the, you know, the kind of goods you buy. Other factors, sometimes we, the buyers, we are ignorant of these terms, don't know that we have these rights. Then at times the value of damage is so small that it's not worth going through, you know. And then also the court system is expensive. So you find that for you to enforce court to compensate you 40,000 shillings, it's not really worth it because you're going to spend, you know, millions to just put the cost in court, through court, the court process. And then most sellers don't have a place of residence. So if I'm saying, but you found your and sold your hair band and stone instantly, where would you find them? The man has already moved on. So those are some of the things that prevent buyers from enjoying these legal terms. So, what are the duties of the seller? What is the law requiring the seller to do? One, the seller must deliver goods. The law requires that the seller is mandated to deliver goods and they must be voluntarily delivered or transferred with property passing to the buyer. So passing of property means passing of legal ownership. So the law requires that the seller must have a system whereby they pass the legal ownership of the goods to the buyer. And delivery of the goods does not only mean physical delivery. Here, yeah, point one, point eight. Also means handing over, for example, control keys, means of control, for example, keys to a car or keys to a house. It can also, delivery can also be by atonement, where you deliver, I give you a delivery order. For example, I delivered goods in a place X and I give you the delivery order that gives you the rights to those goods. Even, even if I just give you the delivery of the documents, for example, the bill of lading, if I gave you the bill of lading, it enables you to pick up your car from Mombasa because you're the owner, because you own it, you have the bill of lading. So delivery of documents also amounts to delivery of goods. I could also deliver to your agent or to your private secretary. All that is personal delivery, but that is still recognized as delivery in law. Now, the duty to deliver the right quantity, that's the second responsibility of the seller. He must deliver the goods and must deliver the right quantity. If he delivers less than what I asked for, the law allows me to take what is given and I pay only that or to reject the entire project, the entire product. I can reject everything. If they deliver more than what I asked for, the law allows me to only take what I wanted and return the other or to reject you know, or to reject everything, or just to take everything. It's still up to you. But whatever you take, we must pay for according to the contract terms and the contract price. So, what are the duties of the buyer? The buyer, on the other hand, their major duty is to take delivery when the goods are supplied. So, the buyer must take delivery of the goods and they must pay the contract price. If they don't, then the seller can sue them for failure to do that. And if the buyer does not take, um, the delivery must be done within a reasonable period of time after the request has been made. So it, it, the law says that it has to be within a reasonable period of time. And reasonable period of time varies from one person to another, but generally it should, you know, that the, the seller must exercise care to make sure that the goods are delivered and they wait a little bit longer so that delivery actually happens. They just don't drop them there and leave them low. They are required to wait a little bit longer and not to be negligent in the delivery process. So these are the, this is the end of my presentation today. And I'll have a final presentation for you after this one. But I hope you have understood the goal of this, um, these slides and the law to help you understand better the notes we gave you long before. Thank you for listening to me.